Good evening. Welcome back. I would listen to that last class, class 12, repeatedly. And then you'll understand why your experience has been able to lack any of good whatsoever, any of truth, not of the good of the pairs of opposites, although it may look like that, but of truth, invariable good, eternal good, free good. You see, now that you understand you must be the cause in order to witness the fulfillment, just like gravity and equilibrium is and must be the cause of water finding its own level, of water rushing to fill up a hole in it. If gravity, if the law of equilibrium were not present, how could water find its own level? How could water fill itself up? There has to be that presence that draws the effect to fulfillment, in the case of the ocean, to equilibrium, to its own level. And indeed there has to be the presence of God consciously living where the presence of the Lord is, there is fulfillment, there is liberty, there is equilibrium, there is wholeness. But where the presence of the Lord isn't, which means where the presence of the Lord isn't consciously happening, consciously being what being is, which means that the whole of experience is being lived as incorporeal, as oneness, as wholeness, as omnipresence, as infinity. If that cause isn't there, where you are, here, where you are, then how can experience come and be equal, come to its equilibrium, come to its fulfillment? It can't. And now listen to this. What have you been doing? Have you not been being a different type of cause? Have you not believed that health of the body or even healing of the body is experienced by some means that doesn't exist in you, that isn't the actual body of you, but by some outer means or by some nutrition or by an operation or by manipulation or whatever it may be, by treatment, whatever that may be. Have you not believed that even us spiritual students, until the day we wake up to class 12, have we not believed that God makes prosperous activity occur, makes dollars come to us from somewhere they're not at the moment? Have we not believed that? Sparks something off that brings dollars into our experience from somewhere other than right here. By definition, if they were all right here already, I wouldn't need them. I wouldn't need to bring them in from somewhere else or have an activity or an avenue that brings my dollars to here, to where I am, to my business, to my bank account. Have we not believed that? And then, because of that belief, we've sat and waited for those dollars to come after we've gone to God, even as truthfully as we've been able to. We've known oneness and yet practiced separateness. We've known of omnipresence except practiced divided presence and then thought that God will be the, the avenue or the vehicle or the activity that brings that which isn't here now to this place tomorrow or the next hour. So now we have unwittingly by, and all of this is slipping into or the activity and the belief of the pairs of opposites. So unwittingly, we've still lived in the pairs of opposites and been the continued cause of our lack experience instead of our fulfillment experience. 
As soon as we separate, remember God is inseparable. And because God is all, we've got to be inseparable. So if we separate in belief anything at all of good and think that at the moment, because we're not experiencing it, it exists outside of us somewhere, and by going to God, God will bring everything together, then we are an unwitting cause that keeps our experience in lack. We're practicing separateness instead of practicing God, practicing oneness, practicing the presence of God. We're practicing the belief that our good isn't here. And that it's out in the world somewhere, or by some means, and by some mumbo-jumbo of spirit, it'll all come together if we pray right, or meditate right, or know right, and then sit in the silence sufficiently long. It doesn't matter how much we think we know, or how much we sit in the silence, if we are practicing separateness, division, and if we're practicing the belief of avenues or vehicles needed in order to bring our good to us or bring more of our good to us, then we are the very lack we are experiencing. And we can't do a single thing about it until we become the cause of oneness. The cause that is oneness is better stated. Until we become God, until we become wholeness. Until we realize that no matter what form we're experiencing, whether it be of body or dollars or relationship or home or whatever it might be, fulfillment of expression or purpose or place or condition, whatever it may be, whatever the form of experience is, we have to know that it, despite appearance, is whole. And not only that, the form is the cause itself, because without the cause itself, the form couldn't exist. Without God itself being right there, no form could even be in our experience, nor were us to experience our experience. The very fact that we're here experiencing any form is God being here. And God is whole and complete. So if we are practicing being anything but wholeness and completeness, we unfortunately are literally practicing lack. We're literally keeping away from our experience. And if we keep that up, we'll find ourselves in more and more lack. Because experience only does one thing. Remember, there's only one God, one truth, one presence, one thing happening. No matter what our interpretation of it is doing. Nevertheless, it's all one thing. And there's only one thing happening, and that's the continual expansion of experience. Everything's always expanding. You can't stop consciousness from expanding. So if we're holding on to the belief in lack, then lack expands. Equally, if we're holding on to the truth of God, then God expands. And we've all known that. Our disease gets worse. Our lack gets worse. Our suffering gets worse. Because we believe we don't have it yet. We don't have God yet. We don't have God form yet. That's entirely wrong. We always have God form because there is no other type of form. But our awareness of God as all form is very lowly. And then it's lowly because we believe the form to be something in and of its own self. And the moment we do that, we believe the whole of the pairs of opposites. And the pairs of opposites, if we believe it, requires and actually witnesses avenues, vehicles taking place, distances, some here and lots more over there. But that's entirely of the pairs of opposites, believed at their face value. But truth is always the wholeness of itself, even right down to an atom or a subatom or a cell. If there is anything, we've heard this in this way in the miracle self classes. If you're witnessing anything at all, then not only is its infinity right there, if you're witnessing one cell or one subatomic particle, then actually what you're witnessing is the whole of the kingdom. 
in that very form, because all form can only be one measure, and that is infinity. So any form is always actually infinite. There is always actually the very presence of infinity of that very form. I remember sitting in this very seat when we had a gathering here some months ago and explaining this with items on the table here, pens, books, notepads, anything. Whatever you are witnessing is actually infinite. There's no other type of form. And it's omnipresent. So wherever it is needed as part of the fulfillment of the scene, it's already there. If we can't see it, or we can't see a sufficient number of it, or quality of it, it's simply because we are practicing the pairs of opposites instead of truth. And if we're practicing the pairs of opposites, we are being the very cause in among the pairs of opposites that keeps Whatever it is we're lacking, lacking, and not only that, but lacking ever more. Now, just like gravity and the law of equilibrium, the minute we're practicing cause itself, God itself, capital C cause, if you like, itself, truthful cause, truthful reason, the principle of truth, the law of truth, the presence of truth, oneness, Go listen to class 12 again. The moment we're practicing truth and we realize as we're in the mind that was also in Christ Jesus and every illumined one that despite appearance an infinity of any and every form is right here. It doesn't matter what my physical senses sense. The truth is that an infinity of any and every form is right where I am. The whole kingdom of God is right where I am. And then rest in oneness without thought about or for the form or the place or the condition or the seeming need, good or bad. Withdraw thought, withdraw attention, withdraw interest, withdraw your sense of need from that which appears to be after you know it's truth, the truth, into oneness. And as oneness, which has no matter in it whatsoever, and as you now feel the peace happening of oneness, the peace of truth happening as your being, you are being the one cause, the one presence of wholeness, completeness, the whole presence of God. And that causes in experience, that is the cause in experience, just like water rushing and filling the hole in the ocean, and finding its own level, you being the one truthful cause causes the effect in experience of all fulfilling form or amount or quality or condition or being or opportunity or idea or innovation or peace or harmony or happiness, freedom to rush to where you are and reveal itself, reveal what's actually already been there and been there eternally but has been undetectable by the material sense, the collective belief sense. So by being oneness, without any care for fixing the pairs of opposites, healing anyone or anything, prospering any condition or any activity or anyone, bringing love, bringing harmony, peace, freedom, security, home to anyone or any condition, without any care for that whatsoever. Realizing it's just a collective believed picture that you're witnessing, but actually that God is there, and the picture itself, even though it may be lacking in something, is the very cause of that very picture. Otherwise the picture couldn't be there in the first place. God is right there. Therefore, 
wholeness is right there, but undetected at the moment. So by coming to oneness, being the cause, which is the feeling of oneness happening, you cause experience to rush to where that happening is, where you are, and reveal fulfillment. But now you see why, despite all your truth study and all your silence, fulfillment still hasn't revealed itself. Because you believed it has to come from somewhere. Something has to open up. Maybe you believed an opportunity has to come. Well, what kind of opportunity could that be? A material one. Something you can name. Someone you can name. Maybe you believe that someone has to bring you some opportunity or some capital or some peace or some harm. You have to be rescued. Maybe you need an idea. Even an idea exists in your belief as separate from you. Maybe that's what I need. I need a fresh idea for my business, a truthful idea. So I'll go to God. I'll feel God. I've been told as soon as I feel the peace, I have God in tangible experience. Now, I'm sitting around waiting for my idea. And I've blown it. I've stepped right back into the pairs of opposites where I believe that me and idea are separate. And that something, my experience of God happening, will now bring me an idea or will be the cause of an idea welling up within as soon as we even do that, in, in experience, it may well seem like that. It may well seem that an idea springs forth. But it's only in experience, it's not in truth. In truth, all idea is already what you are. All of God is within you, is the very presence of you, being of you, mind of you, and form of you, all being one. So you have to realize the finished kingdom again. And you have to realize the oneness of it, the completeness of it, here and now, even in experience, despite appearance at this moment. You have to be oneness, live oneness. Now you understand the statement, where the presence of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where the presence of the cause is, there is the effect. Where the presence of fulfillment is, when you and I are living fulfillment, because we realize that the pictures of our fulfillment, of our being, of God, are mostly, let's say, 99.9% that of collective belief. We're being presented with the pictures of or the conditions or experiences of collective belief. But that has nothing to do with truth. We have to live as fulfilled being, despite matter. Fulfilled being has nothing to do with matter. Matter is just an automatic picture, but the fulfillment is before the picture. The sun is before the light and heat in the universe. Again, if the sun isn't being the cause of itself, the fulfillment of light and heat, and thinks it can lift into an awareness of light and heat and then sits around waiting for it to be witnessed in the universe, it's going to be waiting forever. It has to be that which it then witnesses. And we have to be spiritual fulfillment, true spiritual being, in order to then witness it as experience. Be the cause, and that cause is oneness. You understand that? You heard it loud and clear? No matter what the picture is, there's the whole of God. Therefore, the whole of complete and whole form, and infinitely so, right there despite what our physical senses are able to detect. That's what we have to know then come into oneness to actually experience yourself being the cause, the presence of truth, the presence of God. And as you feel it happening, you're literally placing cause everywhere you go. You're being the cause, the presence of God everywhere you go. 
And that cause is the effect of all of experience rushing to where you are or where your awareness is. Could be on the other side of the world, someone calling in saying, I'm dying, I'm dying. Okay, your awareness is instantly there, wherever there is. We don't even have to know where there is. We don't need a name tag on there because we know it's right here, actually, in truth. And so, on the other side of the world, someone calls, so now our awareness is there. And as we are being the cause, the one principle, the one truth, oneness, uninterested and uncaring about the way matter appears to be, either now or in a minute's time or an hour's time, we don't care. All we care about is being the cause and living that cause living the truth, as we're feeling that truth happening as us, we're literally the cause of whole and hearty form. Perfect form, abundant form, happy form, safe and housed and protected and free form of being or dollars or business or place or condition or communities and then we witness the effect of it, which is that all of experience rushes to wherever our awareness is and reveals itself as whole and complete and healthy. All right, so now you have the way of truth, and because you now understand the way of truth, you understand why lack or ill health or any discord or disharmony in life has not been evidenced by you because you've believed it isn't here yet and it has to come by whatever means that is believed to be. Now you see why the great master reminded us about the truth that we are all gods. He didn't remind us about that in some casual conversation. I am sure he reminded all his students because they were struggling just as we've all struggled to understand how to live and evidence truth. Well, I think that's good and clear. Let's have a few minutes of silence and then we're going to hear a little more from the wisdom of Solomon. And I'm being pushed to add here the Master's wonderful statement that we need to hear here. And that is, to those that have, more shall be given. And to those that have not, even the little they have shall be taken away. By whom? by the only one that is, us. There it is. There's the whole explanation of that beautiful statement of truth. Let's get back to our silence, unless we're nudged again.
right, let's hear from Solomon. You're going to find this fascinating after knowing what you now know. You are unable to make the upright truth, God, defeat the ungodly in battle. You're unable to bring truth to the pairs of opposites to defeat them, heal them, harmonize, prosper them, or to destroy them at one blow with terrible wild animals or a stern command. But in judging them little by little, you gave them opportunity to repent, for you were not ignorant that their origin was evil and their wickedness inborn, and that their manner of thought would never change. Now I love this giving them opportunity to repent. As we are being truth, and perhaps there's no clearer description of what that means than in class 12. I don't know, you have to decide for yourself. But it seems to me that class by class we get an even greater clarity about what truth means and the way of being it. It seems like that to me, but you see, by observing experience by experience, moment by moment, and as we heard yesterday, it's all we can live, moment by moment. Don't go off thinking about the future because guess where the future exists only in the pairs of opposites. So moment by moment, by observing form, condition, activity, body, whatever it may be, amount, dollars, and realizing their truth, as we've heard in class 12, and then being it, being the cause, being the truth of what the form of experience is, this very moment, in the way we've heard, we give it, we give experience the opportunity to repent. Isn't that beautiful? The opportunity to reveal itself as truth. But if we're not being that truth, we're not being that cause, there is no opportunity for experience to do much than it's doing right now. And for you were not ignorant that their origin was evil. Their origin is the pairs of opposites. Their origin has no God in it whatsoever, in and of its own self. And their wickedness inborn, this is all clear now, yes? And that their manner of thought would never change. Their manner of wisdom, their manner of knowledge, their manner of ability is never going to change, nor is capable of changing. For they were a race accursed from the beginning. And it was not through fear of any man that you left them unpunished for their sins. For who can say, what have you done? Or who can oppose your judgment? And who can accuse you of the destruction of the nations which you made? We are the cause of our human or material experience if we continue to believe in it of its own self. So who can accuse us? We're responsible. Or who will come to stand before you as the avenger of unrighteous men? For neither is there any God but you, who care for all men to show that you do not judge unrighteously, nor will any king or monarch be able to face you about those whom you have punished. 
But since you are upright, you conduct all things uprightly, considering it inconsistent with your power to condemn the man who does not deserve to be punished. Materiality doesn't deserve to be punished. It's innocent of its belief in itself as being real. No one or no thing deserves to be scorned or punished or judged. This is why Jesus said, judge not, neither do I condemn you. I have no right to condemn you. I must be about the Father's business. I must be about revealing to you your freedom, your truth, not be about condemning you. And that goes for anyone or anything. There's no use screaming at money. Don't condemn it, it's innocent. It's not its fault, it's our fault if there isn't a plentiful pile of money everywhere we go. And don't think, this is a question that comes up a lot or a confuse or um, confusion that comes up a lot. And that is that people believe that once they're in truth, they should always have plentiful money even when they don't need it. That's completely untrue. You don't need gravity before you need it. But you do need it, and it is infallibly present every time you put your foot on the ground. And this is true of all of God form. You don't need stockpiles of form. What you need is God. And then wherever you are, there is the fulfillment of form, the perfect satisfaction and harmony and wholeness of form, without you having to carry trains of stocks along with you we don't want I don't want piles of money what would I want it for then I have to start caring for it investing it wisely looking after it God I don't want that burden what I want to be is free in God because I know that wherever I am all form is fulfilled all experience is fulfilled as I just stay in oneness as I carry around oneness and feel oneness happening that's all I need because then all form has no choice but to reveal to me harmony wholeness why would I want whatever it is fifty thousand dollars for my month when I have no need for more than three hundred or whatever it is why would I want fifty thousand Can you see any account of Jesus with stockpiles of food and good and body parts, as we said the other day? Wherever the presence of the cause is, the truth is, there is liberty from false belief. And as soon as we have and are living, which is how we have, liberty from false belief, there is all form perfect and whole and complete and balanced and equal. Do you know that good form doesn't come from existing form? If you're waiting for it to come from existing form, then you better stay in the pairs of opposites and do your best. Good form doesn't come from existing form. The dollars you experience in truth don't come from somebody else's dollars. It may appear like that if you look through the lens of the mind and it may appear that someone is buying something from you or giving you a gift or some avenue or vehicle of activity or business or practice or teaching is generating the dollars that you find in your experience. But that's entirely untrue. If you're in the pairs of opposites and believing that, then, as I've said before, in truth, that practice is really nothing but theft. You're stealing from your kingdom. Because you believe that your good has to come from over there, that is somebody else's good at this moment. You believe that your dollars have to come from somebody else's effort 
from somebody else's hard work. That isn't true. Every dollar, when you're in truth, is a new dollar. And every one, as you know this, as they buy something from you, or give you a gift, or however your good, whatever form of good it is, comes into your experience and seems to be coming from someone, every single dollar, or every single bouquet of flowers that are given, or every single card, or every single whatever it is that may be given, leaves them completely and utterly unaffected. It does not deplete them of that form in the slightest. And in fact, as they are now in your awareness, and you are living the very presence and cause of infinity, they will find that they have more of the very form they're giving than they started off with. When the body is witnessed transforming or changing or healing from disease to health, has a new organ been snuck in somehow? Like the material hospitals practice. A donor organ arrives and is snuck into your body somehow. No. No, a completely new and fresh experience of that organ or that place in the body that was diseased has come into the world, come in through the mind into experience and has never been seen before. And remember, there's only one principle, one way. And so if it's true of bodily healing, it's also true of financial experience. Financial healing, relationship healing or experience. Place, condition, business. It's always new and fresh as long as you are the cause of the form which is then experienced as whole and complete. I forget where, but somewhere recently we had a class all about this. The whole class was telling us of this truth. For your strength, and he's speaking of your strength in spirit, your truthful strength of being, truth of being. For your strength is the beginning of uprightness and the fact that you are Lord of all makes you spare all. Your attachment, your concern is not in the pairs of opposites. You release experience in God and the fact that you are being the very presence of God spares all, spares any effort in the pairs of opposites and reveals the truth of all experience. For when men disbelieve in the perfection of your power, you display your strength. When truth isn't evident, your truthful presence reveals, displays truthful experience. And in the case of those that know, you rebuke their rashness. But you, being master of your strength, judge us with fairness and govern us with great forbearance. For the power is at your command whenever you wish it. The power of being, truthful being, is at your command. You have dominion over the entirety of your experience. Again, read about you in Genesis 1. But you and I individually must exercise that truth of being. We must be as we heard yesterday, the presence of truth rather than the divided being which is trying to live truth within but has nothing but matter and the pairs of opposites in the outer. 
And so it is an exercising of being. It is mastering the truth of being all of experience, being all of being, being truthful, being mind and form. We must exercise this, we must be it, we must master it in order to have the mind that was also in Christ Jesus. We must never be fooled, we must never be duped, we must not judge and accept appearance. We must be truth. I suppose we could go into kindergarten or even preschool and watch five or six or seven year olds or so try to understand math. And I suppose we could equally watch them witness on their piece of paper a few numbers. 2 plus 2 plus 2. But then believing that more numbers than 2 plus 2 plus 2 are not existent for them. Because at that stage they may believe that the only numbers they have are the numbers that are written on their piece of paper at this moment. I suppose we could watch that. I suppose we could watch them struggle to understand that the whole of math is right where they are, wherever that is. That the whole of all numbers, the infinity of all numbers and all calculations exist right where they are. And by knowing that, they can bring or witness as many numbers as they wish without limit to any situation or any piece of paper. I suppose we could witness that confusion or that unknowing. But as soon as they realize that math exists within them, all of math exists everywhere. And then when they realize that it exists within them, and so wherever they are and whatever they're observing or whatever they're doing, there is the whole of math. They don't separate it. I've never seen a kid learning math confused about the fact that math is within them, but not out here where I need it on my exam paper or on my calculations. Math is everywhere present. So as soon as the children wake up to this truth, of course, they're never short of numbers. And this is exactly how we must understand truth. As soon as we understand that God is mind, is form, therefore all of mind and all of form is infinite and omnipresent and eternal, limitless, boundless, even right down to each individual form. There is the very presence of and form of infinity. And if it seems not to exist in a complete and whole and harmonious and fulfilled way, if there seems to be a lack of form, a lack of healthy form, a lack of financial form, a lack of opportunity, a lack of love, a lack of peace, a lack of anything you like, it isn't true. Even that lacking experience is here in experience because the very presence of God is there. Without the presence of God, no experience could exist. And in fact, no being to experience anything at all. And so because this is true, all form is infinite. And experience is all a matter of truthful awareness, truthful being. It's because being has been untruthful that experience seems to lack and be limited and be discordant. But as soon as we are being truthful being, which in our class has been called the cause, as soon as we are being the cause, just like gravity is the cause, or the awareness of math is the cause of the freedom of math, and as many formed numbers as we wish to have, and as many formed calculations as we wish to experience. Just in this way, as soon as we realize the truth of form, 
and then realize that the act of experience is an act of God. We have no power, only God is power. Only God sees itself as mind, as form. Or we could say, if you like, through mind, as form. So God has to do the work. Don't we read about the poor in spirit? There it is, there's the whole truth. We're poor in spirit. When I first read that, I was completely disinterested in it. Show me how to witness a healthy body and plentiful dollars. I'm not interested in finding out about how to be richer in spirit because I may be poor in spirit right now. That's not what I'm poor in. I'm poor in health and dollars. But you see, I didn't understand. The poverty of spirit is the poverty of experience. No wonder Jesus speaks of those who are poor in spirit. And how to lift them and comfort them and heal them. Because as our senses are filled with spirit, so that our whole being now is truthful being, have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Be the same being that Jesus showed us how to be. Then our senses being filled with the light of truth, the light of spirit, our whole sensed experience, our whole sensed being, is now filled with spirit, therefore not unrecognized or misperceived, despite appearance. Always it is now recognized as the truth, And in that recognition, we are at one with the cause of truthful experience. And then resting in one and feeling truth happening, we are being. We are the act of that cause. We are the power of the one cause. Right here where we are or right wherever our awareness is, we are now the presence of the Lord, the presence of truth, the very activity of the cause that is truthful cause and in our rest and our silence all we now have to do is behold the effect which as we've heard is all of experience rushing as fulfillment of experience fulfillment of all form the healing of body of all necessary supply or resource or capital or food or happiness or safety or home How are we doing? Are you topped up and ready to be free? I think so. So let's sit together as cause and be utterly satisfied with this experience.
feel that peace. Now, realize that that is the cause which is the form of your whole universe fulfilled, complete and whole. This is what you live. This is what your whole experience is. This is what you're satisfied with. Don't step back into the pairs of opposites and look around. Where is it? Where is it? Because then you're being the very cause you do not want to be. This is what truthful life is. This is how we live it. This is how we experience it. We're free. We're unconcerned about appearance. We're free of it and it's free of us at last. We've been the trouble all along. Remember, remember, Jesus in the Gospel of Thomas, which is wholly appropriate here. I'm so glad I have prompts behind me. If you are experiencing poverty, you are being poverty. But now that experience is free of us, and we of it, its appearance cannot fool us. We know its truth. We rest in that truth. We experience that truth happening and there is it, the beginning and the middle and the end, all complete. We hear in scripture, I am the beginning and the end. I am the Lord and besides me there is none else. Therefore why look for something else other than oneness being not only the cause, but because of oneness, the form as well. And if we are being oneness, and if we are satisfied, utterly satisfied, with the experience of oneness felt happening, then we are being the form of wholeness, because oneness is never incomplete. And we'll soon witness that truth as we witness the effect of us in truth, of our very presence in truth, because the whole of the world of experience cannot keep its fulfillment away from where we are. Life doesn't get much better than that. Thank you, thank you.